I know that you guys are probably all waiting with bated breath. You know, I, I really don't know what that phrase means. Maybe it means that your breath smells like bait. Anyway, I know you're all waiting and wondering, what happens when I add an amine to an aldehyde or a ketone? Well, wait no longer, for here is the answer. When added to aldehydes or ketones, amines form this type of compound, which are called imines, with the letter I at the beginning. If you're wondering what the mechanism of imine formation is, then look no further than this crazy blankety-blank slide, which I lifted from your book. I could talk you through it, but I have better things to do, like actually teach you something important. The point is, if you react an aldehyde or a ketone with an amine, it forms an imine. And what in the world can we do with an imine? Well, you'll see that the imine in this diagram is shown here. If you take that imine and treat it with a base, denoted here by this B, it will strip a proton on the carbon alpha to this imine carbon and generate this type of compound, which is called an enamine, also an enamine. I love the word enamine because it sounds like the Spanish word enemigo, which means enemy. Are you an amigo or an enemigo? Are you an amine or an enamine? Here's what enamines can do. Once again, I can begin with my ketone. And if I want a circumstance where I wanted to generate or to alkylate at this alpha position, have a big long carbon chain of some kind, what I could do is treat this ketone with an amine, like this cyclic amine shown here, and then with base, and it would generate this enamine. If I treat this enamine with an alkyl halide, like this alkyl iodide, then the electrons in the nitrogen push down, and the electrons in this double bond come out and attack that carbon, attaching this alkyl chain here. You can take an, am an imine like this and treat it with acid, and it will actually hydrolyze it or convert it all the way back to a ketone. So this is one way of being able to take a ketone and put an alkyl group adjacent to it. You convert it to an, um, an imine first by reacting it with an amine, and then let that imine be treated with a base to convert into an enamine. And then the enamine reacted with an alkyl halide, and then you hydrolyze it with acid. That was a very long sentence, but here is another example. I can take my ketone, treat it with this amine. It will generate the imine and then the enamine, which are not shown here. And then I can react that with this acid chloride. And it will acylate this group. After I treat it with acid, it hydrolyzes off the imine and gives me back my ketone. I think that's pretty cool. Imines are fairly reactive. Hence, there are a lot of useful things you can do with them. For example, if I take my ketone or aldehyde and treat it with ammonia or any other amine, I can generate my imine. Imines by themselves are traditionally somewhat unstable. But if I take my imine and then treat it in the same flask with hydrogen gas and palladium carbon, it will reduce this double bond down to a single bond by adding hydrogens to this carbon and this nitrogen giving me this amine. Let's review this process. I can take a ketone, convert it to an amine, by first converting the ketone into an imine, and then treating it with hydrogen gas and palladium carbon. This whole process from here to here is called reductive amination. Here's another example of reductive amination. This time I'm not beginning with a traditional amine, I'm beginning with an amine that has a, an OH on it, a hydroxyl group attached to the nitrogen. When that amine forms on the ketone, it gives me this type of compound, which is an imine, except 
that it has an OH coming off the nitrogen instead. This type of imine is called an oxime. When treated with hydrogen gas and palladium carbon, it also will give me out the primary amine. So this is an alternative way of generating the primary amine through an oxime intermediate. Oxime intermediates are traditionally more stable than imines, which is one reason why this approach is sometimes better depending on the individual circumstance. And now I have to share with you guys a personal anecdote. Some time ago I worked as a postdoctoral researcher in Colorado. One of my fellow researchers told me about a former postdoc in our research group who approached him one day and said, Hey, I just learned about the coolest reaction. It's called reductive emanation. Now this story is humorous to me because here was a guy who had a PhD in organic chemistry and had never heard of reductive emanation before. And this is a reaction that we teach college sophomores. When I heard that story for the first time, I began to suspect that this guy might have received his PhD from one of those coin-operated claw machine games.